Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Hi, we're back again, and uh, we're going to finish the uh, third week of lectures um, by discussing uh, the atomic force microscope as a system. And this is something that I uh, try to instill in, in my students here at Purdue. Uh, I'm trying to convince them that uh, you shouldn't view the atomic force microscope just as a piece of equipment. Uh, rather, you should look at it as a, uh, a, an entire system. And this requires you, for optimal use of the instrument, requires you to optimize the entire system. Uh, surrounding the microscope. Um, so very often um, when I talk about system, uh, students th tend to think just the electronic system. And certainly that's one part of the, uh, uh, the entire puzzle. Uh, so I've tried to collect here based on the previous lecture uh, some of the important signals that uh, any atomic force microscope uh, would would have. These electronic signals are often best accessed uh, using some sort of a, uh, a breakout box that can usually be purchased from a, a company. All right, so there's usually a computer. Uh, you can buy this breakout box which allows you to get ready access to all these, ver these different signals. And then uh, the important signals that actually control the instrument and that are relevant to mapping out topography at least in the contact mode scans that we're focused on in, in part one of this course, right? All those signals can be accessed by this, uh, this blue box here, which, which schematically represents the breakout box. But, uh, when I talk about viewing the AFM as a system, it's more than just the electronic signals, right? Uh, um, and I, I try to encourage you to set a long-term goal to view this AFM instrument uh, uh, as a system that must be integrated properly into its environment, okay? Uh, this requires you to perform measurements uh, that better characterize the overall performance of your system, and um, it, uh, it also uh, forces you to better understand the limitations that your environment forces on you when you use an, an atomic force microscope. So I realize that a lot of these measurements may not or, or won't be performed. Uh, you're not going to listen to this lecture, in other words, and run out and perform a, a, a large number of these measurements uh, right away. Um, but sometimes it helps for you to have a perspective. Um, and so that over a period of maybe three to six months, uh, as you start working through a variety of different uh, experiments, uh, you might be able to, to uh, perform some of these measurements and have a better sense of, of, of the overall level of performance of your, of your system. So what do I actually have in mind? Well, uh, I think it's very useful if you could try to measure the uh, vibration levels of, your, uh, of the floor that your microscope is located on. These microscopes tend to perform better if they're located in basements of buildings rather than in uh, higher floors. And it's kind of useful to have a, a criteria for, for uh, characterizing the vibration levels of your, of your floor. So in this slide, I just present one of those classification schemes that allow you, to, by measuring the velocity, the RMS velocity of your floor vibrations as a function of frequency, it allows you to characterize the uh, vibration uh, 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 vibration levels uh, uh, in the room in which your microscope is located. <clears throat> a typical office uh, in a in a typical office building is uh, is located on the top uh, portion of this graph, and this sort of sets the scale for vibration levels. Uh, this would be considered a very high vibration uh, room. Um, notice that the frequency of vibrations goes from on the order of one to on the order of 100 hertz. If you start to go higher than 100 hertz, you start to talk about acoustic vibrations, acoustic noise coupling into your instrument. Uh, 
Frequencies below 100 hertz tend to be characterized in terms of vibrations of, of four levels in your instrument. Uh, for me, uh, if you can achieve this so-called uh, vibration criteria dash E, the VCE level, which is basically a three micron per second uh, vibration of the floor over the entire frequency range of your uh, measurements from let's say one to 100 hertz, if you can achieve that in your lab, uh, then I believe you've, uh, you've, uh, you've, you've got a very good, very quiet lab to work in. Um, I just provide the vibration standards in table format. Uh, sometimes it's easier to read this than the chart. Uh, so this is just here for, your, for future reference. Um, if you make the effort to characterize the vibration, the, the four vibrations in your lab, then, then it's also a good idea to measure the acoustic noise levels in your lab. And again, the acoustic noise levels, there are characteristic curves that, that uh, are set that allow you to, to do this uh, characterization in a rational way. Uh, and here I, I'll make the point that acoustic noise is usually defined to lie in the range from about 20 hertz to about 20 kilohertz, give or take a little bit on either side. And there are various noise criteria uh, that are specified uh, by these, these various uh, lines. You can see, if you look at this chart, you can see there's a threshold for hearing, uh, which is indicated by the dash line. The closer your, the vibrational noise in your, I'm sorry, the closer the acoustic noise in your room in which the AFM is located, the closer that is to the threshold for hearing, clearly the better off your, your instrument's going to perform. So I did some measurements in one of our labs here at Purdue. Uh, they're indicated by these, these red dots. And it indicates that the room that one of our AFMs is located in has, lies somewhere between uh, uh, NC25 and, and let's say NC30 uh, 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 guidelines. Um, I think it's also important for you to uh, uh, measure the thermal stability and relative humidity in, in the room in which your AFM is located. And I think these measurements have to be done over longer periods of time. Um, so I, I would recommend that you borrow or buy a temperature and relative humidity data logger. Uh, very often these, these are simple devices with sensors that you can set on a lab bench. And you can acquire data over a 12 hour period of time. You can then download that data into a computer and start to do temperature stability plots, variations in relative humidity, and you can start to get a sense of, of for the particular environment that your instrument is located, right? you can start to get a sense when the, let's say, temperature inside the room is, is, uh, uh, is constant over hours of time. And that's, of course, if you're doing careful work, that's when you want to focus, uh, focus your efforts. Uh, this was really important for one of the labs that, uh, that I uh, occupied here at Purdue. This lab <coughs> uh, was, was sort of offset from the main building and uh, the sun. Uh, a after about one o'clock in the afternoon, the sun would just beat down on the roof of this, this outcrop building. Uh, vibrationally, it was very stable, but temperature-wise, uh, we had huge... Uh, huge uh, swings in temperature, something on the order of five degrees centigrade uh, on real hot summer days. So uh, the students that worked in this lab would tend to come in at night and, and, and uh, get their best data after the sun set. So that's one of the issues that you have to deal with because thermal stability of the room uh, can influence the uh, performance of your microscope. Um, I'd also recommend that you characterize the uh, uh, Z noise uh, in your system, right? And and so to do this, um, I want to introduce this idea about a zero size scan. So, for instance, um, if you place the tip in contact uh, with a very hard substrate, and you tell your AFM software to perform a, a scan size, which is zero nanometers in the X direction and zero nanometers in the Y direction. You hit the go button, uh, 
what should happen is, let's say if you're going to acquire a 256 by 256 pixel image, right, what will happen is that you just basically digitize the, the uh, Z signal coming out of your, uh, um, your controller, right, and you'll get your, your software will think it's performing a, uh, an image, but the size of the image is zero nanometers, basically means the tip's not scanning. And what this allows you to do then is it allows you to analyze that image in terms of, uh, um, let's say, the noise that's a, that, that results is, uh, during the time interval that, it, that, re, that that's required to uh, achieve this image. So you can then analyze this zero uh, size image using the histogram analysis tool in your software. and. Uh, Ideally, if your instrument is, is performing uh, very well, right, the noise in, your, in the topography of this zero size image should be a very sharp spike located at some, some uh, offset voltage or some offset position. Um, and by measuring the full width at half max of this distribution, you start to get a sense of the Z noise in nanometers that characterizes your, your particular system. So this check is a very useful check to do, especially if you're using an instrument in a multi-user facility where you don't have uh, complete control of the instrument. You just maybe come in and use it uh, one afternoon a week. Uh, you can real quickly tell if the uh, instrument is performing properly by uh, performing a zero size contact scan on a very hard substrate and keeping track of the histograms over a period of, of time. And th this way you can tell right away if, if everything's working properly or not. I think it's also very useful for you to develop the ability to uh, uh, obtain uh, 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 time domain signals from your instrument. So this is important, for instance, uh, uh, if you're trying to track down noise sources because very often the noise sources occur at specific frequencies and uh, by acquiring a time domain signal using a, let's say a standalone PC which is equipped with a data logger right, doing a Fourier transform analysis of a time domain signal you can then start to identify characteristic frequencies that may crop up in your uh, system. So. If you have a breakout box, uh, this is usually a pretty simple task to achieve because you can just connect the uh, data logger to various uh, signals and then uh, uh, digitize those signals over a few seconds of time and perform an analysis afterwards offline. Uh, it helps you identify the various noise components that, uh, that are present. So, uh, there are two, two types of measurements that you might consider taking. Um, one is uh, the, just doing a fast Fourier transform of the time series data. Uh, so you can, uh, for instance, uh, monitor the signal coming out of uh, the four quadrant photo detector. Um, and you can acquire thousands of data points over a few seconds of time if you, um, you then Fourier transform that, you'll see that there will be characteristic noise spikes in the uh, output of your uh, photosensitive detector, and these noise spikes are then telling you something about the noise that's running around in the electrical signals of your AFM. <clears throat> this is important, um, especially when your instrument is working uh, very well, because then if you can perform this measurement, you have a sense of what the signal should look like when everything is, is, is functioning properly. Uh, if you file that information away and something goes wrong, you can always pull it out, take another data curve, compare the two, and you can start to make sense uh, of, of what might have happened uh, uh, between the time the instrument was working very well and the time where the instrument is very noisy. We already mentioned this um, uh, the zero size image and an analysis of a histogram from that zero sized image. So I won't, I won't repeat myself on that, but that's also a very useful uh, technique to use uh, to better characterize your system. Uh, very often uh, it's useful for you to know um, what the height resolution of your instrument is. In other words, what's the smallest height difference that you can measure?
Uh, so I try to indicate how that might be done in this particular slide. Um, so if you, for instance, measure the noise in your ZPAZO uh, by doing this uh, zero-sized histogram image, uh, and then you also measure the noise in your photosensitive detector uh, by digitizing the, the output of that photo detector when, the, let's say, the tip is not in contact with anything. That should be a very stable situation, hopefully, right? You can assume that the noise source from the ZPA zone, the noise source from the photo detector, add in quadrant, uh, add in quadrature, that just basically means that, that you uh, sum up the, the ZPA zone noise and the photo detector noise, as I've indicated here, the length of that yellow arrow then is the uh, uh, the minimum delta H that you could measure, right? So uh, this requires you to, to to know how to convert the photo detector signal in volts into nanometers. Uh, the ZPA zone noise is probably already uh, given to you in nanometers uh, because it's, it's it's obtained from the software of your system. So right, you have to add these two things with the same units and, and when you do that you can you can estimate with the uh, the minimum delta H that you can resolve for your system so I, I encourage you to, to perform that measurement sometime uh, over a period of two or three months after you become familiar with the instrument that you're using um, it's also useful to characterize the thermal noise in your AFM system this is technically a topic that will be discussed in more detail in part two of the course, but I like to mention it at this point in time. Um, the idea is that if you, um, if you carefully calibrate both the sensitivity and spring constant of, your, of a particular cantilever, right, then you can, uh, um, you can move the tip above the uh, sample, let's say, and and using this ability to digitize the output of the photosensitive detector, right, you can measure the thermal noise that causes the cantilever to vibrate as a function of time. And I just <clears throat> I just show some typical data uh, of this thermal noise. So this is the photosensitive detector output measured as a function of time. The data has been digitized, and I just use that digitized plot uh, here, right. The data has been shifted so that it's uh, the average value is zero. That's an important consideration here. <clears throat> and um, knowing the sensitivity of your photosensitive detector, and that sensitivity is calibrated from the slope of the force versus distance curve, uh, force versus displacement curve that, that you take. And we'll talk about that more in week four of the course. Right? But knowing that sensitivity, you can turn this voltage signal into a, a, a height variation, a height fluctuation. Right? And that height fluctuation is then representing the thermal vibrations of the cantilever as it is it it's buffeted by the air molecules in your in your instrument. Well, <clears throat> that that deflection, the root mean square value of that deflection is just equal to uh, thermal noise, right, divided by the spring constant of the cantilever. And I've indicated the appropriate equation here. So you need to know the temperature of, the, of your lab in degrees Kelvin. Uh, you know, need to know the spring constant K of the cantilever. Boltzmann's constant is a fundamental constant of nature, so you can calculate, in theory, what this root mean square noise of your cantilever should be, and you can then compare that to what you actually measure. And uh, um, this is a, a real good way to check and see how, how if, your, if your instrument is being limited by thermal noise, which is the best, best situation you can have, or if you find that your measured uh, fluctuations in your cantilever are considerably larger than this quantity KBT over K, square root of, right? Then you know that there's something else going on. So. Um, this is another useful check, and, and the details will be covered more in part two of the class because it involves uh, a fluctuating cantilever, a cantilever that's in dynamic motion. Uh, first part of this class course is focused on the static cantilever, a cantilever in contact with the substrate. Um, I think it's also useful to uh, focus on the thermal stability of your system, and one way to do that is to do... Uh, 
uh, one of these force versus uh, displacement curves where you come in, uh, you approach the substrate to the tip, you cause the tip to be loaded by the substrate, so there's a finite loading force that the tip applies uh, to, the, to the sample. And once that tip is loaded, then what you want to do is you want to settle. You want the software to stop moving the tip with respect to the substrate. And ideally, you like the, uh, the, uh, the loading force to be constant over time during this time interval, where, which, which I label by settle in the uh, uh, upper portion of this slide. Uh, ultimately, of course, you're going to withdraw the tip and you're going to measure the adhesion of the tip as, as, you, as you withdraw it from the sample. But it's very interesting to know uh, with the feedback loop turned off, right, uh, how constant the, the applied force is with time. So ideally, you'd like it to be a fixed number. Of course, it never is, right? In practice, what you're going to find is you're going to find some drift, as I show in the bottom portion of this slide, Right, and by characterizing that drift, uh, you get a sense of the thermal stability of your instrument. So, uh, those of you that have software that allow you to make this type of measurement, this is another thing that you might consider doing in order to characterize the thermal stability uh, of your system when the tip is actually in contact with a hard substrate. Um, and lastly, I'd like to, to uh, uh, emphasize that knowing the diameter of the laser spot that you uh, position on the uh, cantilever, that's a really useful number to know. Very often companies will provide you with a specification for that laser spot diameter. Um, it's really a very useful uh, exercise to try and actually measure it experimentally. In the old days, what we used to do is we used to just take a, a razor blade and systematically move it across the laser spot, measure the intensity of the light that struck a, 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 another photo detector. Um, and and by, by measuring the intensity versus position of the razor blade, you basically uh, uh, could map out this, this intensity profile, technically you get the integral of this intensity profile as you slide the, the razor blade across the spot. Um, so you have to integrate this equation, which is the theoretical expression for how the laser intensity should vary as a function of radial position uh, from, let's say, the center of the laser spot. Uh, but uh, by, by performing this, this type of measurement, uh, you can then infer what the, the diameter D of the laser spot is. There's probably easier ways to do it now than, than, there, than there was 25 years ago, but it's, it's really useful to know that diameter for the laser spot. That helps you in your selection of cantilevers, and uh, it gives you a sense of, of how finely focused your optics uh, uh, are for the particular system that you're using. So. It's a useful measurement to consider. It's kind of hard to do if you have a commercial system that's all, everything's all packaged up. But somewhere along the line, somebody made this measurement uh, in the process of designing the laser and, and the optics that focus the laser onto uh, the cantilever. So uh, those are just a few ideas for things that you might consider measuring as you try to optimize your, your atomic force microscope. In, a, in an experimental lab. Um, it's difficult to do all these measurements in a systematic way. Uh, it's the sort of thing that you can, you can if, you, if you have it in mind, you can perform a measurement or two every, every other week or so, and at the end of six months, you'll then have a pretty good sense of how, um, uh, how well your, your microscope is integrated into the lab room that, that you're actually using measurements, uh, that you're actually performing your measurements in. So, uh, we're going to move into week four of this course. Uh, we're going to start to discuss more experimental aspects of uh, force spectroscopy, um, uh, force versus displacement, force versus distance curves. Uh, the next topic we're going to discover, or we're going to discuss is, is, uh, is about cantilever mechanics. So we're going to derive a lot of the formulas that I just wrote down earlier this week. Uh, so come on back and, uh, and, uh, 
we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll discuss the cantilever mechanics in a systematic way. You'll all be able to understand what's going on. You'll understand where these equations come from uh, that show up in all the, uh, the papers on atomic force microscopy. So we'll see you next time.